now His Eminence, Dr. Mustafa Sirk. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Good evening. Dobar večer. I did have many lectures in my life, but this tonight, uh, being at uh, MIT MSA, I must say that just uh, getting off from my airplane at the Boston and having in mind that I have to sleep. But seeing you here with good faces, and especially to my fellow brothers and sisters uh, who are, have organized this lecture for me, I must say that I have lost my jet lag and trying to get back to you to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Well, uh, it is always that those who will listen may get asleep and those who who give lecture, they are supposed to be awakened. And I know one teacher that he slept on his lecture. I hope that you will not. Even though I know the story about the hereafter when the taxi driver and the preacher were in there, and the taxi driver was told to go to heaven and the preacher to hell. So the preacher was complaining, my God, I was preaching all my life for you and why you are putting me in the hell. And this taxi driver was driving people crazy on the street. And the voice came and said, you know, while you have been preaching, people have been sleeping. And while this taxi driver was driving people crazy on the street, Everyone was praying for salvation. <laughs> I hope that you will pray for salvation as I will speak to you so that we'll all go to heaven instead of hell. Well, uh, I am, as you are told, Grand Mufti of Bosnia, my name is Mustafa Tseric, and the name of my wife is Azra Tseric. She is here with me, so you can be sure that I will speak shorter. She will tell me to stop. <laughs> and my daughter Adila is also with me here. She is born in Chicago, so she wanted to come with me to see her home. So welcome home, Adila. I, <clears throat> what, what it means to be the Grand Mufti of Bosnia? It means to be the Grand Mufti of Bosnia and to take care of the Muslims and Islam in my country. Now, <clears throat> I hope you know where is Bosnia. It is not in uh, Australia, it is not in America, it is not in Africa, it is in Europe. And it is in Europe, in Balkan. And in Balkan it is so-called ex-Yugoslavia. And it is very close to the Adriatic Sea. It is bordering with Croatia and Serbia. It is a small country of four million people, Bosnians and Serbs and Croats, who are Catholics and 
Orthodox and Muslims, and, we, and also Jews. And by the way, I have to tell you that the Jewish community settled in Bosnia Herzegovina in 1492. These are the Sephard Jews who were expelled from Spain. And the uh, great Sultan Mehmed Fatid received them, uh, about 70,000 of them. These Jews have been living in Sarajevo and in Bosnia Herzegovina all these years, except that, except that in the Second World War, uh, the Hitler's occupation of ex Yugoslavia and Bosnia Herzegovina expelled many of them. But the Haggadah that they brought with them from Spain was saved twice with a Muslim by a Muslim Korkut family. And this Haggadah is now in the museum in Sarajevo. I am telling you, just to give you the picture that we Bosnians, or Sarajevo is like New York and like America, melting plot of all the cultures, civilizations, and so on. And now, of course, you will ask me, of course, why did you make war then? Uh, I don't have the answer to this question. But the only thing I can tell you that there was no reason for war in Bosnia-Herzegovina whatsoever. Now, I will not speak to you to war about the war, but I'll tell you about the peace. And we are getting in Bosnia-Herzegovina as much as we can. But allow me to say something before I start reading you my paper, which is going to be very boring, but I hope you will uh, be patient with me anyway. I want to tell you, as Americans, to be proud of what you have done in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We will never forget the American people and the American government, whichever is, that you helped us to survive genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina, despite the fact that we did suffer genocide in Srebrenica on 11th of July 1995. But it would be worse if it not were for the U.S. intervention and stopping the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So if, if it means anything for you, and it means for us a lot, I want you to be proud and don't lose your patience to do good around the world. I think you have a lot to offer and you should think of yourself as good as you have been always. And of course I am impressed by my fellow uh, Muslim students who just uh, went with me to the prayer room and I led the uh, night uh, or Maghrib prayer with them. This is possible in, the, in, in America. And I am com coming from Europe probably to tell you that I am worried about the future of the Muslims in Europe, especially after recent events in Denmark and regarding this cartoon of the, of the Prophet Muhammad and the discussion that we are and the, and the rhetoric that we hear now in Europe as to the Islamophobia and not to say about anti-Semitism and the other things that you hear from time to time. Now because of that, I thought as my duty, first as my right to participate in shaping a new Europe and to give some perspective of what is to be a Muslim in Europe and what Europeans should know about us. And the second, it is my duty 
as an autochthone European Muslim to tell the Muslims who live in Europe how they should behave themselves in the European environment. I don't know whether they are going to listen to me, but I thought it is my duty to tell them and it is my right to participate in the shaping of new Europe. And because uh, based on that right and duty or obligation, I developed something I called a Declaration of European Muslims. The tragic events of 11 September 2001 in New York, 11 March 2004 in Madrid, and 7 July 2005 in London leave no one indifferent. Muslims around the world especially have been shocked by the fact that the perpetrators of these terrorist attacks claim to have acted in the name of Islam. No reasonable person can accept that such violence against innocent people be carried out in his or her name. So Muslims across the globe have condemned the terrorist attack in New York, the massacre in Madrid, and the terror in London in the strongest terms possible. But many people say that it is not enough. Muslims should do more to persuade European public opinion that their faith is worthy of respect and that their stay in Europe is welcome. When I use Europe, it, it, is, it can be applied to the West in general. And because of that, we, I believe that I have to come with a definition of Europe for Muslims. Those of you who know Muslim history, and especially political theory, they will remember that the Muslim old theorists, political theorists, have divided the world into so-called Darul Islam and Darul Harb, which means the house of Islam and the house of war. So you either live in the area, in the realm of, the, of Islam where you are free and you can exercise all your Muslim rights or you live outside of that realm and that is the world of war. In that world of war you have two choices. You may migrate or make hijra to the Darul Islam or you may fight or engage to jihad in order to make the, the space for yourself. This theory, I think, is outdated. Even though it is not only of the Muslim mind, you know that Aristotle believed also that those who are outside of Athenian state or Athens are barbarous, not civilized. And in the Christian theory, political theory also, those who are outside of the church of the Christendom they are lost souls. So this is a kind of middle age, I think, attitudes toward the, the kind of political theory. Now I think I will leave it to the Christians or to others to say whatever they think they should say, but as far as, as we are concerned, I think, especially in Europe, I think that these, this theory is not any more valid and it must be changed. So I am offering a new, a third alternative, which is that Europe is neither the Darul Islam, the house of Islam, or nor the Darul Harb, the house of war. The Europe is the Darul Ahd, or Darul Sulh, or Darul Salam. It is the house of contract, house of peace and house of reconciliation or to use Jean-Jacques Rousseau term the social contract. I, have, I can bring a lot of doctrinal and historical arguments for that. We have, you know that the Prophet Muhammad made the constitution in Medina when he came with, because he found in Medina Jews and Christians and others and also, you can go through the history and find that this kind of contract 
with other people to live in peace and cooperation is possible. So the problem is not whether we have this, con we can accept or not. The problem for Muslims is how to develop the concept of this social contract or the, uh, how, what it means for Muslims. So we should say that a contract is the dictate of reason, whereas a covenant is the will of heart, faith. Hence, we define the Muslim as a man with an alliance to God as an act of the will of his heart, faith, and we define the citizen as a man with a duty to the state as an act of the dictate of his reason. By the covenant, man gives his heart to God and receives inner security. By the contract, he gives his reason to the state and receives social security as an inhabitant of a city or town. A citizen is entitled to the rights and privileges of free man. He is a member of a state, a native or naturalized person who owns loyalty to a government and is entitled to protect, prote protection from it of his life, religion, freedom, property, and dignity. Europe, as the house of contract, opens the way for a sincere dialogue, not only with Christians as such, but also with the European society as a whole. Let us be clear here, understanding of Europe is very important for the Muslims. We believe that Europeans or the Westerners in, in general understand Muslim world more than they are willing to accept it. And the Muslims are accepting the Western world more than they understand. So we believe that Muslims should learn the philosophy and the and politics and all and civilization that is uh, pertaining to the European experience. Politically, the Muslims in Europe must know what their human rights are in terms of their representation of their community. They must insist on the re re renewal of the prejudices towards Islam and Muslims that exist in the general European public created by the biased media and supported by some political establishment. Islamophobia is a result of political and cultural intolerance and hatred. We must teach Europe to accept the Muslim values and to appreciate the sweat of Muslim workers and intellectuals in building a prosperous and free Europe. It is not only historically that Europe owes to the Muslims for its freedom and prosperity, but also it is the contemporary Muslim contribution for its development that gives us the right to say that Europe owes us very much. Europe has never been a, a continent of one religion, of one faith, especially when we come to the contribution of the Muslims and Jews throughout the history. Islam came to Europe through uh, through the peninsula, Iberian Peninsula in 8th century and made, as you know, a great contribution of the culture and civilization that became an inheritance of Europe. You know that in Spain, uh, Ibn Rushd Averroes developed and explained the uh, Aristotel Aristotelian philosophy that was a vehicle for uh, raising and uh, creating a humanist, humanistic humanism and renaissance in Europe through the city of, uh, of Italian city, uh, Ferenza, and due to, the, to many Jews who, have to leave, who had to leave Spain because of certain intolerance that came up with some Muslim rulers there. Uh, and then when, uh, the, when Islam and Judaism ceased to exist in the Iberian Peninsula, Islam came to the Balkan Peninsula in 1463. And then it was a kind of continuation. We now don't have except some traces of a cultural uh, significance in Spain or Andalusia, but when we don't have Muslims. 
whereas in Balkan we have still Muslims, Albanians, Bo Bosniaks, Torbesh, Pomaks and other groups that survived all this, all this history. I am one of those who have survived this history in the Balkan Peninsula and my people. We Bosniaks uh, now in Bosnia and Herzegovina are two million. Four million, we believe, uh, there are Bosniaks who migrated from Bosnia and Herzegovina during this last century in, to Turkey. These Bosniaks have been naturalized as Turkish citizens and they, um, some of them still speak Bosnian language, but archaic one. When I go to the airport in, in Istanbul and when they see that uh, I am from Bosnia, they, all, they, they know how to tell me I am Bosniak and I am from Bosnia huh? and nothing more. But they know that their parents are from Bosnia. And we also we believe that outside of Bosnia there are about a million and a half Bosniaks who live all around the world. In the United States I think about 20,000 now you have Bosniaks who have been uh, as refugees all over the United States. So we believe that around 8 million Bosniaks live now in, around the world. This is a frog frost approximately. I don't have exact figures, but this is my estimation. So these, Bosniak, these, these uh, Muslim, Bosniak Muslims have survived and in the Balkan Peninsula. You know that Albanians are three million in Albania and one million in Macedonia and they are two million and a half in Kosovo. So uh, they are 80 or 90 percent are Muslims. And you have small uh, Torbesh Muslims who are in basically in Macedonia and you have Pomaks also who are here in, in, um, uh, in Macedonia or and then uh, you have Muslims who are of the ethnic ethnicity of the Turkish or origin. So altogether, I, I believe that there are these autochtone Muslims, uh, all Albanians and Bosniaks and Pomaks and Torbesh, around approximately um, 15 million who are scattered in Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Macedonia, Slovenia, Croatia, and in Europe, especially those who were going to Germany for working and, and other European uh, cities. So these are autochtone Muslims in Europe. But you have Muslims who, uh, who migrated from outside of Europe, especially in England, uh, from the subcontinent of India and Pakistan. In, in Germany, you have Muslims, uh, most of them from Turks, from Turkey. And then you have in France, you have Muslims who came to France from uh, Africa, from Maghreb, from Morocco and Algeria, as you know, as a consequence of the colonization or the engagement of France in Algeria. Uh, no one know, knows exactly how many Muslims there in Europe, but my uh, estimate is about 30 million or more you have now Muslims in Europe. These Muslims in Europe unfortunately are organized in a, a way uh, that uh, does not give the perception or does not give a real picture of uh, they, uh, of the Muslim presence because they don't have institution. Muslims are organized more on a tribal or ethnical or national basis rather than on a universal message of Islam. Uh, my purpose of this declaration is to emphasize or to call for institutionalization of Islam in Europe or in the West in general what it means to institutionalize Islam. I don't know exactly, but I do know that Muslims in Europe need 
a kind of organizational discipline, meaning that we have to know who represents us and that we should know who is spokes spokesman or spokeswoman for Islam. This chaos that we have now, it is good in, a good thing in the hands of media, and you know, whatever you don't like it, you just blame the media. So you will always win, because media is responsible because you are wrong. Uh, I, uh, of course, uh, you, you, you know what I mean. But still, media is, is uh, Abu Hamza, who is telling you that the Jews and Christians should be killed is more attractive than me telling that we should live with Jews and Christians in a peaceful way and make a dialogue. Because to tell that Jews and Christians should be killed makes news. But my calling for dialogue with Jews and Christians doesn't make a news. So you have, uh, this is, and, and therefore you always are reminded that there is a difference between a politician and a preacher and a journalist. Politicians uh, don't know how to tell the truth, uh, or most of them. Huh? The preacher or priest don't know how to tell the lie, and the journalists don't know how to make the difference between the two. <laughs> so you always have to try to tell them how to make the difference between the two. In my... Uh, in my effort to do so, uh, I made my declaration, uh, uh, I addressed my declaration to the European Union. But is it all about that the others should do uh, for us? Is there something that the Muslims themselves must do in order that the others are capable to do it or that are willing to do it? Yes, I think that Muslims, and this is why the second uh, part of this declaration is about Islam and about Muslims. And my uh, appeal or my uh, ad addressing the issue to Muslims who live in Europe or in the West generally. And what is, uh, what is my, my message too? Uh, I believe that the Muslims in Europe should have several principles in order to get their things straight. First of all, we should understand that Islam is about the East and the West. I believe that Islam is used and abused both in the West and in the East. In the West, in the East, people believe that Islam is the solution. In the West, people believe that Islam is the problem. In the East, people believe that they defend Islam against all the enemies. And in the West, people believe that Islam is a threat to their way of life. And therefore, in the West, some, some people and some politicians need heroes, so they create heroes by defending the West against Islam. And in the East, they also need some heroes to say we are defending Islam. I believe that both of them are using and misusing Islam. I don't think that Islam needs any defense of the sort that we see, but Islam needs an understanding, deep understanding, of, of the message that is very inclusive. I don't, I, I hope that you will understand me why I am saying this and I am emphasizing very much. Uh, I, I believe that the Muslims are the most responsible people to carry out and, uh, the dialogue between the Jews and Christians and to promote the tolerance among the Abrahamic faith. Why? Because it is in the Quran, and probably very uniquely, that Quran speaks about the Christians and Jews and tell good things about them. Of course, Quran 
criticizing the Jews and Christians, but Quran is criticizing Muslims as well. But Muslims don't see that. They see only when the, when the critique is toward the Jew, Christians and Jews. But at the same time, they are forgetting that it is in the Quran, and this is the holy book, that it is said, and I, I uh, cite this, uh, by, uh, um, uh, so the, in, in Arabic, so to show you what I mean when it is said in the Quran, those Muslims and Jews and Christians and Sabaeans, if they believe in God and in the day of judgment, and if they do good deeds, they have no reason of fear nor to grieve, meaning about their salvation in the hereafter. You don't find in the holy book of others to tell good things about other religions. But in the Quran you have this. And therefore Islam is inclusive religion. It, it does not, it, I can quote you now many other verses uh, that, that uh, to, uh, to, to this uh, 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 direction or to this argumentation. And therefore when Muslims those Muslims who are exclusive, who are claiming exclusivity of their own salvation based on their being Muslim, I think have no right to do so. On the other hand, I think the Muslims are told to be inclusive and because of that they are responsible to carry out the dialogue and to uh, promote the tolerance. If they don't do this, this is not to blame the Quran. This is not to blame the Prophet Muhammad. This is not to blame Islam. It is to blame the, the individuals who do so. Unfortunately, when we compare the uh, attitudes of some people, Christians or Jews, or uh, even those who are neither of these, if some Muslim do something wrong, they don't blame him, they blame the Prophet Muhammad, the Quran, the Islam, and everyone. But when somebody, I think, from the Jews and Christians do something wrong, we cannot blame Jesus for that, or Moses, or because this is not the way we should do it. Because there is somebody who is responsible for that certain act that he has done. This is what, what Muslims are expecting, that we stop blaming the Prophet, the Quran, and others, and uh, other Muslim uh, uh, sacred things, I, I think. We should blame those who did what they did. And uh, so, uh, based on that, I think we have to rise above this uh, uh, abusing and misusing Islam for our small uh, worldly purposes. But while Islam is about the East and the West, Muslims are not. Muslims are in the midst of the reality of the East and the West. I do believe for, uh, when we compare this East being, uh, let's say, uh, like uh, Islam and the West uh, with its... Uh, culture that we know it now, the Muslims relied uh, more on the grace of God than on their work. And the West is uh, uh, relying more on their work than on the grace of God. So what we have to do, I think, is in the between. We Muslims have to work harder and, of course, count on the grace of God and in the West, they have to count on the grace of God and hard work. And that's the way I think we have to learn. And we who live in the West, we can teach Muslims who live in the East certain things probably that they are not willing to listen probably now. And because of that, I, we believe that we in the West should adopt the first, first principle, and that is read and learn. Read and learn in the name of God. It means then that the revelation of the Quran did not begin with the imperative of faith, 
but with the imperative of knowledge. God Almighty did not ask Muhammad, peace be upon him, to believe, but he has asked him to read and learn what and how to believe. This is so because man is born with faith. There is no need, therefore, to ask man to believe if that is already in his soul. But there is a need to remind man that he ought to read and learn what is in his soul. So man needs knowledge with faith as well as faith with knowledge. And here is where both East and West need Islam to teach them. The East to practice knowledge and the West to appreciate the faith. Second, believe and work hard. Men neither live in a pure spiritual world without matter, nor in a pure material world without spirit. The secret of success is that man unites in himself these two values, his spirit and his body. In other words, the purpose of man's life is in the activity of his spirit, and that is his faith, and in the activity of his body, and that is his hard work. Third, be pious and respect your parents. The Quranic emphasis on the relationship between the worship of God and the respect of parents has a strong message both to the East and the West. The message to the East is not to concede to the pres pressure to give up on the family values, and the message to the West is to stop the haraz haraz hazardous game with the future of humanity. The institution of family tradition has no alternative. The issue of the family values is not only a moral demand of human society, but also an existential condition of humanity. Fourth, be honest and fight for your rights. The success here and the salvation in the hereafter do not come by themselves. One should go after his or her success. One should fight for his or her rights here and now. Also, one should work for the salvation in the hereafter. One should deserve God's mercy. And fifth, be aware of tomorrow. In the verse of the Holy Quran, there is a clear proof that we have the right, nay, the obligation to plan our future and to believe that our future may be better than our past. It is really peculiar how some came to the idea that the Muslim future is hopeless and so the hope is only in the Muslim past as a way of life and a goal of history. This idea has no foundation in Islam. It is not only that God teaches Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that your future will be better than your past, but also the common reason tells us that we cannot change our past, but we can, with God's help, shape our future. So we are not responsible for the past Muslim history, but we are responsible for the future Muslim history. That is a past that is that is past nation, said the Quran. It belongs to it what it has earned by itself, and to you belongs what you have earned by yourself. So the Muslims should not be afraid to think about their future in the same way as they should not be possessed by their past. The Muslims have future because they have faith in God, and they have faith in God because they believe that the truth and justice will prevail. And I will give uh, also to this idea of futurism that we have to develop uh, the quotation by John Scar, who said, the future is not a result of choices among alternative paths offered by the present, but a place that is created, created first in the mind and will, created next in activity. The future is not some place we are going to, but one we are creating. The paths are not to be found, but made, and the activity of, main, of making them changes both the maker and the destination. Creating the future does not involve getting in your car, reading the map, and then heading off to a defined destination. No, creating the future is all about building a road that does not yet exist to a, pla to a place where no one has yet been. End of quotation. 
And my third address of the declaration in, is to the Ummah or to the Muslim world. We believe that the Muslim world should understand that the globalization is uh, a benefit or you, you should take advantage of the globalization rather than condemning the deglobalization. Why? Because today Muslims live all over the world and it, it is in the Muslim interest to work for global peace and security in the world. And because of that, we believe that the Muslims should be part of the peace process of the Security Council of the United Nations. Today, you have five permanent members of the uh, Security Council, United States, France, Great Britain, China, and Russia, or Soviet Union in the past. I don't think that you need to be an enemy to the West in order to become a member of the Security Council. The Muslims should, or the representative of the Muslim world, should be in the Security Council for two reasons. One, to learn the process of peace, and the second, to take responsibility for the peace and security in the world. And because today, the all, all wars that are conducted today are in the lands of the majority of Muslims. So the question of the war and peace is very much connected with the Muslims, with the Muslim mind. And therefore, Muslims should be engaged, should be part of a global process for finding the way out of the conflicts that are uh, threatening us, and especially if we know that Muslims are holding the uh, space or the place where the most uh, energy uh, exists that the world, especially the Western world, needs. And because of that, I think it is in the interest that we have the peace in the East. And there cannot be the peace in the West if we don't have the peace in the East. So this mutual uh, this common interest that we, that Muslim world have and the, uh, and the West, I think, should be noticed. And because of that, we believe that the center of Islam should uh, move, should be faster, and should uh, get some global uh, messages that all Muslims who live around, uh, around the globe, that they can receive the positive messages for for their participation in a global society. Now, I think that we are not speaking anymore of the guest workers somewhere in the West, but we are speaking more and more about the global citizens. And we are becoming global citizens in one way or another. And By introducing these ideas, then I have developed a declaration that, of course, uh, it will take me too long to read uh, to you, but this declaration is, uh, in fact, uh, a clear and unequivocal condemnation of the terrorist attack of New York in September and in Madrid and in London. Why I am doing this? I am, as I said, as, uh, as you have been told, coming from Bosnia. We have experienced the genocide in Srebrenica, despite the Security Council resolution of the safe zone of Srebrenica, and despite the fact that the Dutch soldiers had the duty to protect Muslims in Srebrenica. Unfortunately, on the 11th of July, 1995, 10,000 Muslim boys have been killed in one day. You know, the difference between this genocide in the time of war and the terrorist attack in the time of peace is that in the time of war, you can predict that the genocide might happen. In the time of peace, it is shocking, like you have 11 September in New York. That was not anyone, anyone, anyone's mind. 
And, and this happened after saying never again of the Holocaust in Europe. The Serbs, especially in Belgrad, have denied all along that genocide has never happened. Last year, we uh, had this uh, uh, commemoration of the 10th anniversary of Srebrenica. On that occasion, 100 U.S. senators wrote their declaration saying that what happened in Srebrenica was genocide and that it is not acceptable. That was for me something that I could not but feel obligated to come out and to say what happened in on the 11th of September in New York, 11th of March in Madrid, and 7th of, of July 2005 in London. I have to say it clearly and without mentioning anything that this is not on our behalf. This is wrong. Why I'm saying that? Because I heard many Serbian journalists or politicians, they would say, yes, Genocide is wrong in Srebrenica, but we Serbs have been suffering for five centuries, and they, were, they started counting all what happened to them, you know, during this time and that time, and then they forgot Srebrenica. Some Muslims do the same thing. They say this is wrong, but then they started talking about all the kinds of what the West did to Muslims and they forgot the 11th of September and the 11th of March and so on. So I saw that it is not, it is not moral just to connect everything together. We have to say this is wrong, regardless what people did to us, if we did something wrong to somebody, and that is wrong. And this is uh, the reason I thought and, and my motivation for writing this Declaration of European Muslims. This declaration was uh, read first in August last year in Leicester University before 3,000 Muslim students. And then uh, I also introduced it to the Muslim intellectuals in London. And then uh, it was uh, introduced to in Zagreb it was adopted by all the muftis in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, it was read in Sarajevo. And I uh, recently visited uh, Strasbourg when I speak before the European parliamentarians of the Pan-European Party and the president of EPP Party, European uh, Public Party, People's Party, and I'm hoping that uh, this is the first time that I, I am saying that and reading it in the United States of America. So this is my way of expressing and sharing with the American people what happened on 11th of September, uh, expecting that they will take this as a sincere effort that we have to work together and to develop what I call the ethics of sharing, because we have so many things to share together. We have to learn how to do it, and we will all be happy, and God will be pleased with us. As to the Muslims who live in the West, and in, in Europe in particular, if you like, recently uh, we are hearing some voices that say that God is not happy with us, because somehow we live in Darul Harb or somewhere, uh, I want to tell you, and you quote me here and in the hereafter, God is pleased with us and he likes us and, we, and he knows what you are doing. And the road to heaven goes from Europe as well, as well from the United States of America. 
So we have to be optimistic and hopeful. And of course, whatever we go, we take from each other something. And friends are the ways of God's help. So thank you for your listening. You have been very kind and very friendly. Thank you. Any questions, please? Okay. You, sir. Okay. I have a question regarding Srebrenica. Everybody, the, the most conservative estimates are that 100,000 people were killed by Serbs, and that's when you have names of the people, that's 100,000, and American estimates are 200,000. And yet, all the time, you are reducing the genocide in Bosnia only to Srebrenica, where only 8,000 people was killed. This is exactly like a Serbian lawyer, and this is in connection with this green book. I can tell you now, I didn't believe in this book, now I believe. In this book is the proof that some Muslim clerics worked for the Communist Party, spying their believers in the mosques. And when this, that was discovered, this man, as leader of the professional organization, protected those priests. Can you imagine that? A man comes to a priest, and that priest tells what the Communist Party what he tells. And the Communist Party, as a paranoid organization, locks a man, and then when it was discovered and proven, this man protected those priests. He is a spy of communism, and that's, why, that's how he came to the power. That's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is, uh, you, we are uh, in Boston, so you, you, this is freedom of, sp of speech. You can, you can express your... You, you, but you can, you can come to Bosnia even harder you can speak now in Bosnia. I think uh, what you are saying is half of the truth. So you have to have the whole truth. Um, so, I came to the United States in uh, 1981 as a uh, imam to be in Chicago for the Islamic Cultural Center. But before I came to, to Chicago, I went to the American Embassy in Belgrade. It was ex-Yugoslavia. So, I had to sign the paper in which... Uh, I pledge that I will not spread communism in the United States of America. And that was the most pleasant signature that I had in my life. So you can imagine that the communists, they, they know everything, who was doing what. And therefore, uh, as far as the communism is concerned, and about this book uh, that you are holding, I know it very well. Uh, I hope uh, that you will understand that you are here. I don't know where you live in Boston. And I am in Sarajevo. I know better than you do. So just give me a chance to do my job and you, and you do your job. And God will bless us all. Inshallah. Uh, well, uh, Srebrenica is a symbol. I, I am aware that what happened in Forcha, in Visegrad, in Vlasalnica, in uh, Priador, in Rogac, everywhere. But Srebrenica was the only area with Jepa that was protected by the United Nations, and it was a safe zone. And it is uh, direct by written the responsibility of the international community. So we, we are uh, using the name of Srebrenica as a symbol. Uh, you, you know, because people will not understand if we just start uh, counting all the cities. And all the cities in Bosnia-Herzegovina witnessed kind of genocide. 
So if we are, you know, in the, in the Jewish history, in the Holocaust, Auschwitz is the most telling story about. But it was not only Auschwitz. So I, ho I hope that you will, you will, you try to, uh, uh, to understand metaphoric rather than, you know, uh, saying all the time, every time. And Srebrenica is a symbol. Uh, 10,000, we are now building Memorial Center. Uh, we, uh, and you have every 11th of July uh, the commemoration of that. And therefore, we are not forgetting others, of course, but in, in a communication with others. We are using Srebrenica as a symbol. I hope you will understand. Like you have a flag of your country or something. Yeah, before you introduce Srebrenica as a symbol, the Bosnian was a symbol of Jerusalem. The whole Bosnian was a symbol. Excellent. Well, exactly. And you introduced the Srebrenica. Thank you very much. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you so much for coming today. I think that your speech was wonderful, and I congratulate you on leading this effort. Um, I'm a historian of Bosnia, and I know that the Muslims in Bosnia have traditionally bridged the East and the West, and I think it is truly wonderful that you have taken the initiative to do so again at this point in history. Uh, my question for you is, what role do you think that Muslims in Bosnia and the is Islamic community in general in Bosnia can play going forward on the European scene? Obviously, as you said before, uh, you're not getting as much press as others. And I'm curious um, exactly what role you think Bosnian Muslims can play going forward in, in this important venture. Uh, very good question. I, we believe that Sarajevo should be the uh, city of peace or dialogue uh, between the cultures and uh, civilizations. You know that the Prime Minister of Turkey and uh, Spain have introduced the proposal of the Alliance of uh, Civilizations as a response to the Huntington idea of the clash of civilization. We are advocating that, you know, the Sarajevo was the city where the uh, last century started with war, and it ended, the last century ended with the war in Sarajevo. We believe that the beginning of the next century should be peace of Sarajevo. And the Sarajevo is a good city for an uh, annual festival of peace. And we as Muslims, as Bosnian Muslims, we believe that we have this credibility. I hope we will not uh, uh, lose it and uh, we will keep it as much as we can and that the Sarajevo is the place where Jews and Palestinians can meet because they all, all of them are welcome to Sarajevo and hoping that in the future that Sarajevo will be like a Geneva Convention of War that we will have the Sarajevo Convention for dialogue among the cultures and civilization because in Sarajevo you have a laboratory of all the uh, churches and synagogues and mosques and all these things. So uh, uh, multiculturalism or, or uh, multi-faith for us is a natural thing. It's not, it's, nothing, it's not of the academic exercise. It is living every day in Sarajevo. So thank you very much for... We are hoping uh, that the people, that Europe will understand that we can teach Europe about Islam, but also that Muslims will understand that we can teach them what is Europe. But at the moment, they think that we are small, so they don't listen to us all the time. But I am optimistic and hopeful, and I think we can play a great role, and this is exactly what I am doing about this declaration. Can you, do you have water? Um, Just... um, thank you very much for your speech. I would like to touch on two issues that you mentioned in your Declaration of European Muslims. Um, the first one is about um, your asking for the political freedom um, which will uh, allow European Muslims to have a legitimate representative in the parliaments of European countries. Um, I would ask you to explain that further because 
to my knowledge, is, uh, nobody is elected because, to a parliament because of their faith and shouldn't be in a secular country. The other issue um, concerns also your asking for the rights to, for Muslims to order certain areas of their lives uh, according to their cultural um, ways, which to me sounds very much like introducing the Sharia, the Islamic law. Again, I don't understand how that can um, be coordinated with uh, the democratic um, development of a secular country. Thank you. Well, uh, to your uh, first question uh, regarding uh, the political representation of Muslims in the European Parliament, saying that Muslims should have their representation, there is something that is called positive discrimination. There is, this is known. Uh, uh, I agree with you that somebody should not be a political representative because he's a Muslim. But she, he should not be denied to be so because he's a Muslim. So at the moment, I think we have this denial of becoming a foreign minister of let's say, uh, European Union, because you are Muslim. Uh, I hope uh, you don't have this written. No one is, has uh, written. But uh, I, what I'm trying to say, that Muslims should be treated as citizens and as anyone else in, in Europe. And they should have the right, and you have some Muslims who are now in the, some European parliaments, like in England, you have some, even some lords, and uh, you have, uh, I think, in, uh, in uh, Norway, you have one uh, Bosnian Muslim who is there. Uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that this is a, a ghettoization, as some critics uh, were telling me, that we want to isolate Muslims. No, because we are treated now in Europe as Muslims. You know, they are treating us as Muslims. They are telling us you are Muslims. And we cannot say now, come and say we are not. And until we come to, the, to this point, and, I, and therefore I, I, I am advocating for the new Westphalia. You know that in uh, 1648, after 30 years of war in Europe, that liberals, not religious people, Liberals came with the idea of the Westphalia peace. And this Westphalia peace meant two very important issues, the political tolerance and religious tolerance. So we believe that we need a new Westphalia in Europe in which Islam and Judaism will be recognized as European religions together with Christianity. And now it is not the case. And as to your the second question, as uh, uh, I said, that Muslims should be allowed to have a personal status law for the certain specifics that they have, especially in the family, in the family affairs. Uh, I think you are very familiar that Muslims are very much family-oriented, and we believe that it is our right. This is not imposing Sharia on any, anyone, but it is Muslim right, as you have, uh, you have uh, the Jewish law, if you like, you have the Catholic canon, you have... Uh, but uh, I still believe that the civil law that we have in Europe is very much up to the uh, Sharia law in terms of protecting five basics, five values. Uh, right to, li uh, uh, to life, right to freedom, right to religion, right to property, and right to dignity. So this is the basis, basic, I think, that Sharia is advocating, and it is very much compatible what we have in the civil, civil, uh, civil law. Uh, I, I, I think if declaration opens the discussion about these issues, including this, then we have succeeded in creating the atmosphere of debate. This is not, not final, this is not, uh, not something that is concluded finally. Yes, um, I have two short comments and a question. Please. First comment is, uh, even though the um, Srebrenica can be a good metaphor for the whole of Bosnia, 10,000 dead is not a metaphor for 200,000. So please, when you say 
genocide, don't say 10,000 victims, say 200,000 victims. Uh, another question uh, pertains, I'm, I'm familiar with the book that he's talking about, and I know that some of the people listed in documents published in the book are in the very highest branches of your organization and still remain there. So that means if there were operatives before from Belgrade, that means that they could still be operatives now. Uh, one more thing. Um, the question is, you've said a lot about, uh, you know, the atrocity of genocide and how bad that is. But you've never mentioned an injustice that is going on in Bosnia right now. And the fact is that all of those, not just Srebrenica, but all of those cities that were violently, ethnically cleansed, that went through genocide, are now in a part of the country reserved for Serbs. It, in fact, it is called Serbian Republic. Um, and Muslims, Bosniaks, Croats cannot go back there. So it seems to me that, you know, they have human rights over there. They do not have equal rights. And, you know, it is, it is difficult to talk about a crime of genocide, you know, and how bad it is without mentioning that uh, its effects are still being, are still going on and that they should be changed. So. Okay. okay. As to the number, I think it's, uh, you know, you have this in the Old Testament that is repeated in the Quran when somebody was killed and uh, people didn't want to tell who was a killer and you have in the Old Testament in the Quran it is from now man qatala nafsan bighayri nafsin fa ka'annama qatala nasa jami'a wa man ahyaha fa ka'annama ahya nasa jami'a and it is from now an that one who kills one person, it is as he has killed the whole humanity. And the one who uh, is caused for live one person to live is, af, is as if he has saved the whole humanity. So it is not the question of number, whether it is one person or 10,000 or 200,000 or whatever. You cannot think in, the, in this number number way. Of course, that this is different between 10,000 and 200,000. Again, I am telling you, this is a metaphor. If you want to understand it, all right. If you don't want to understand, I am not, I am not by any way minimizing and I am not any way neglecting the whole genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina. By the way, the number of 250,000 or uh, I think uh, uh, the, the number people are disputing and still uh, trying to find out exact number. Not only Muslims, but also there were Croats who were killed and Serbs who were also killed in the war and because of, of many other things. So as to the uh, book, you know, this book was... Uh, written by a Croat author who lived in, uh, I think, in the United States or in uh, Australia, I don't know exactly. He, this, these are the st uh, stolen copies of uh, so-called secret police. And this is not complete. This is only, uh, and, and if, you, if you can imagine, uh, in the totalitarian regime, everyone was registered, whether he is good or bad. So those in secret police, they, were, they had a book in which they would write about good person. This gentleman is a good person, so he should not be disturbed. So if you read now this statement, then you would say this was cooperating because he is a good person. But he didn't know even that they have written about him this statement. You know, you can, this illustration, this is called illustration, meaning going back and examining who did what in the communist time, in the time of the totalitarian whatever regime, where all people who lived there cooperated 
in that regime in one way or another because you had no chance to be, if you are outside, you are outside of the country. And those who did not want to be there, they came here and they went somewhere else. So, I mean, this simplification of what the imams did and what they didn't do, I know very well. I am responsible for that before God and be, because we know what it means to live in that regime. And they did not do anything wrong. So uh, you, you may not accept or accept, but this is my responsibility and this story for us is finished. If you want to continue to deal with this, you are free to do so. Please. Um, I'd like to correct you on several points of uh, what you said first, but even now, I think number is very important. And to call genocide in Bosnia, genocide in Srebrenica, is disrespectful to dead. I have to say that. Second, in the beginning, you implied something to a uh, sense that what happened, why did war start, and why did we need all this animosity? I have to say that war did not start. We were invaded by a foreign nation that wanted to wipe us off the map. This is not brother killing brother, like you said in one of your previous speeches. We were, there was genocide committed on us. And finally, a, uh, well, I guess that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay, I think the, the point about uh, uh, Bosnian history and, and, and genocide and, and all of that is, might not be of interest, uh, you know, uh, to um, same level of interest for all members of the audience. So if we can sort of focus more on the topic of we've spoken enough about it. Uh, thank you. I'd appreciate, you know, any other questions. Please. Go ahead. I have a question uh, about the... I'm your are you Bosnian or no? Small question. Small question. Are you Bosnian or no? I'm not Bosnian. Forget the matter. Go away. It's not yours. Next time, if I listen from you, I'm going to ask you. Excuse me. But we will talk with the spies. With the spies. Sit down. Okay. See. Uh, brother Dekhil, Brother Dekhil, oh, oh, let them, let them speak. Let them speak. All right, please. I was in Bosnia, I was in concentration camp, I, I was in, in, in Bosnia army. Uh, you was over there every time. You are a good man. You are my hero. God bless you. Thank you. Please, you have you have a question, Leila? You yeah. Have? Please. I have a question that relates maybe more to the um, topic of the today's talk. Um, uh, when you were talking about the, your suggestion about institutionalization of, of Islam, that is uh, what you are uh, suggesting for European Muslims, I was wondering if this implies um, centralization of religious leadership and also unification of Islamic uh, religious practice. Um, and what is that, what we can learn, for instance, from American Muslim condition? Um, what I have researched so far is that uh, what I like about Islam is that uh, it gains qualities through its spread and through its hybridization around the world. Um, and that is exactly something that we can um, learn from American Muslims uh, that are adopting certain models like mosque organizational models of congregational models of church, for instance, um, and translating that into their context. Uh, yeah, maybe you can reflect on that a little bit. Thanks. Well, I, I, I don't know exactly what I mean by institutionalization, but I think this is something that is going to be developed in the, in the process, in the way of dialogue. Uh, what I, uh, there are two things that bothers me as, as a Muslim, that the Muslims in Europe are organized on the basis of tribe, national belonging, ethnicity, rather than a universal idea of Islam. This is one. And the second is, is that the teachers that should be
teaching the new generation of youth, of Muslim youth, should be raised and taught in the European and Western environment. Because at the moment we have teachers who are coming from outside sometimes and have difficult time to adapt to the environment in the Western society, European society. So this institutionalization, it means this. And basically it means discipline, uh, meaning that uh, we should know who, is, who speaks for Islam and, and who, who is the qualified for, to speak. Now we have so-called newborn Muslims or fast Muslims who are very, who are, you know, reading few books and uh, then they come and make a revolution of, of everything. Uh, and those, you have those people who, who claim that God spoke to them yesterday. And, and then they have the revelation on their own. So these kind of things are coming and people, and then Muslims are confused. And then European, Western audience is confused. They don't know what is there. And the images that are being sent are very wrong. You have Vatican, who is a spokesman for Christianity, let's say overall, but for Catholics in a specific way. In the case of Islam, you have so many people. I just came from Mecca, and we had the first meeting of the, of the Muslim scholars of the 30 countries, and we formed so-called the forum, the World Forum of Muslim Scholars, exactly with this aim, to somehow try to get an official face of Islam. Because you have now several faces of Islam, a political, a cultural, a spiritual, and economic, and then you have a terrorist, you know. Uh, what is the most, the most famous is the political face and the terrorist face. You don't look at the cultural face of Islam or spiritual face of Islam to the extent, for example, that Ibn Rushd and Ibn Sina are of the Arabic origin and Muslims, isn't it? They were the great Muslim philosophers. But their names have been changed to Avicenna and Averroes, isn't it? So I was suggesting that Osama bin Laden be changed to, give in, to be given the name, I don't know, Smith or something, because, because he represents the political or t terrorist face, let's say, of Islam. And he's very much attractive in the media. Than, and if you ask any Western student who was Ibn Rushd and Ibn Sina, they wouldn't know. They know Avicenna and Averroes, isn't it? So when they were, I, I hope that one day when the students would ask, do you know who is Osama bin Laden? I don't know. You know who is Smith? I know. I mean, I'm just taking as a rhetoric to say that Europe and the West must learn that there is a cultural picture of Islam. There is a spiritual picture of Islam. It's not only political Islam that, that we are getting. And this is, and my declaration is, uh, is exactly because we have to face this and to say that we are not, this is not, Islam is not a political message. There is also spiritual and cultural and so on and so on. Unfortunately, we Muslims themselves ourselves are not capable all the time to present this cultural and spiritual Islam in the best way. We have to learn how to do so. And this is why I mean institutionalization, meaning that somehow we know who is responsible for what. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for your insightful presentation and great ideas about the uh, future of Muslims in Europe. I'm also from Turkey and I'm very familiar with uh, a lot of the things you were um, telling us and the, the, the way to look forward and to forget about our past and to train our muftis and imams and, and preachers. All this is great, but I'm just trying to figure out how we can realize all these goals in, in reality, in European, uh, in, in European reality, taking into consideration you know, bad examples of muftis and imams like Abu Hamza and, uh, and the good examples like you. How can we uh, increase 
you know, numbers of, of muftis and imams like you, uh, with the, you know, when, when, it, when you say that Darul Harb and Darul Islam, these all outdated theories are where the part common, commonly shared logic and philosophy and wisdom of the pre-modern world, but the Europe or the West put this uh, pre-modern wisdom behind it and came up with a new logic and wisdom. And many Muslims also did, but still there's a fraction, uh, and maybe some people even would say the majority of Muslims still don't believe in this modern values and modern uh, principles. So coming back to the Quranic value of approaching other religions and peoples, قُلْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ All people come to a common word between you and us, between a common pact, to, to common values, set of values and principles. So how can we make, for instance, the principle of equality of women? before law as a part of this universal common set of values and principles and make Muslims you know, be convinced sincerely, not only as a means only to reach something, but as the goal itself, as the part of maqasid sharia as part of the higher objectives and principles of the, of the Islamic message and the Qur'an. And how can we create and you know, train such muftis who would, who would raise the consciousness level of Muslims to that civilizational level? Thank you very much. Well, I, I think we have to start, and one, once we start, I think we will reach somewhere. So, if you believe that uh, what uh, we are doing is good, then uh, I think uh, we are uh, started already. So, uh, let me tell you something. Politics is too important to be left to the politicians, and theology is too precious to be left to the theologians alone. And the issue of the war and peace is too, too dangerous to be left to the generals alone. So we have to work together. You have to speak to your muftis. You have to speak to your imams. You have to tell them certain things. In Bosnia, you know, this is, uh, you, the proof is that this gentleman, he's from Bosnia. You see, he can speak to his mufti like this. Uh, and then in Bosnia, in, in Bosnia, in Bosnia, if, you, uh, if I say something wrong in mosque, the people will be waiting me in front of mosque saying, you know, this is not right. So you, I, I'm, I'm saying you have to develop this kind of communication, and therefore you, uh, imams have to be careful and muftis what they say. I, I believe, I think that we have no alternative. The European governments have no alternative. They have to start... The, and create the environment in which the imams and the teachers of Muslims will be trained in the European environment. I think this is, uh, this is the way we have to go forward. And I am very much optimistic. I believe in a new generation of Muslims, in you who are in here in the United States, who are studying at, at uh, MIT, you will make changes. I mean, don't wait for this, all your parents to make the changes. They, they think now probably in a different way. That, but you will change. And the generation that is born in the West, of Muslims, who are very honest and very good Muslims, who are very much educated, and, but they need a new service, a different service for what they used to have. So I believe that we are on, on, on our way to, to reach that. A long way. But it is a way. Please. Well, thank you. This is great, actually, because on a series of lectures about Islam in Europe, there's only mention of immigrants, immigrant Muslims in Western Europe with no mention at all about Muslims in the Balkans or European Muslims. And uh, not to uh, provoke any more uh, heated debate, uh, but mostly just to have some more factual information about the state of Islamic uh, religious practice in, uh, in, in Europe, in the Balkans especially. I wanted to ask a, a question about the uh, diversity uh, of, uh, of, of Islamic societies in the Balkans or Islamic practice in the Balkans, and especially with the uh, known Sunni presence of Muslims in the Balkans at, at the moment, at present time, and how you see them being incorporated in your vision of uh, being uh, more inclusive within the European Union. Thank you. I, I, I don't think that in the Balkan we have problem with uh, Sunni, Shia, uh, uh, I mean, relations. I think uh, we are in, live in such an environment that we don't have time to see who is Sunni, who is Shia. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think uh, we are very much... Uh, 
concern about our own community, and we are overcoming, I think, uh, these kind of, of differences. Of course, you know, by, by, the, by Bosnia being open and exposed to the world, we have been, as Muslims, exposed to uh, some kind of different interpretation of Islam during these last uh, years. Huh? And probably some individuals get a different interpretation, but majority or mainstream of Islam is Sunni Islam. If it, uh, we don't say it Sunni. We don't, we don't call this Sunni Islam. We say it Islam. And we are, we are called Muslims. And we are not called Shia or Sunni. And, and so we don't have this difficulty, I think. Uh, we have more of, of, of the other, uh, other kind of difficulties that we are facing. And, and, and we don't have time. Uh, uh, we have experience in institutionalized Islam. And this is why we believe that we can offer to Europe. I am the institutionalized uh, let's say, representative of, the, of Islam in Bosnia-Herzegovina, holding these posts, which is called Reisul Ulema, or the Grand Mufti of Bosnia-Herzegovina, that was established in, uh, in 1882 with the um, uh, Manshur that came from Istanbul and with the approval of the Joseph, the, uh, uh, the Frank Joseph I, which is the monarch, Catholic monarch, of the Austro-Hungarian time. So he established this approved, and I am the 12th in the row of this so-called Reisul Ulema that has the authority, an official authority, an uh, uh, official face. And this is very unique, almost in the whole Muslim world, because I am not appointed by the king or the, by the president, but elected by the Muslims. And there's a body of 300 people who elect uh, to a term of seven years. So you, you cannot uh, deceive 300 people or majority of them. So this is what, what I think gives us legitimacy. Now, this is what we are trying to tell. To, and when people come from the main Muslim lands, because most of the religious dignitaries there are appointed, you know, they are part of the government structure and we are independent from, from this. And because of that, I think we, are, we have more freedom and more autonomy to interpret and people are more convincing, and we are more convincing when we tell them what they should do and they listen to us. So this is why we don't have these internal frictions. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's my turn. Yes, you are thank waiting you. for long. You Please. speak much wisdom, my friend, and we thank you very much for coming. I've worked in Bosnia off and on for the last three years, and it's a wonderful culture. Uh, one of the questions I had is a lot of money comes in to build the mosques all out through Bosnia from Saudi Arabia. In my own observations, you know, this is from a Western perspective, I would feel better if the money was going to roads, hospitals, and schools. Could you maybe comment on that? I mean, it's not no offense to, the, to yeah, what the Saudis I, I, are doing. I perfectly, I, I know what you are saying. First. Let me tell you, we had this uh, Ottoman culture, which is very much influenced by the Byzantine cult, uh, architecture. You know, those who, who study architecture, they know very well. Now, uh, unfortunately, these masks have been destroyed. We were not able, capable to protect them in Banja Luka, Ferhadiya yeah. Mask, and in Focha, Alaja Mask. Those uh, the um, grandchildren of the Ottomans are not now interested to protect these masks, let's say. And the Saudis came to us in 93, 94, and they offered us to build some masks in the areas that there were no masks before because communists didn't allow masks to be built in the area of urban area. And of course, they, they build a mask, and these masks are under our control. So now, as to the question uh, why they are building masks and don't, don't build the roads and schools and, you know, jobs and so on. Uh, they did, uh, in fact, uh, Saudis, they did, for example, the whole village in Bershko. They right. built it I and think. they built some roads and so on. But, you know, there is something that uh, you, I, I hope you will understand. 
there are a lot of Muslims in the Muslim world who are rich. Oh, and know. then when they have this money and they, uh, they are about to go to hereafter, they want to earn something here. So they believe if they build a mosque, they will earn paradise. So when we tell them, okay, why don't you build a road? He says, I'm not sure about the road. <laughs> so he wants to build a mosque. And this is, I think, basically, I, I hope you will understand. You. And then, you know, I, I, I approach many of them. I, I was telling them, all right, okay, we, we understand. We need the mosque. But we need the school. Believe me, two years I am trying to find <laughs> donation for, for a school. I cannot. Yeah. Because he said, oh, that's very good. He listens to you. Very good. Very nice. But he doesn't give the money. But when you tell him about the mask, because mask is, you know, some, some kind of, we have the saying of the prophet who built the mask on the, on the here, God will build him the, the house in the paradise. So that's the motivation. Okay. That's where politics comes in, my friend, and you have a lot of work to do. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tom Butler. I'm a retired professor of Slavic languages. And uh, for the last four years, I've been bringing American students to Gracenica to work. We have a summer school there. We teach three levels of English. Uh, professor Friel, who just spoke, teaches American studies. Uh, we bring something of America to Gracenica, but we always go away with more than we brought. It just happened that one day I was sitting in front of the Cafe Modena, and your father-in-law walked by. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I see. I was this is, this is his daughter here. His daughter is here. Very it's good. Amazing. It's amazing the feeling of intimacy that you can have in that environment, how they take people in, whereas, you know, I can't see that happening in our country so, so easily as it does, yes. does over there. Um, and I'm going back again this summer with some more students. Each year we take students from around this area. Uh, but I have a question about the Wahhabis. And uh, in a way it illustrates what you spoke about, the, the problem of the many traditions in Islam, the, the problem of getting some sort of harmony with such a, a very traditional background. And I had heard in Gracenica that the Wahhabis were actually going out to the villages and trying to persuade people, the men to grow beards and the women to wear the veil, and they would give them a monthly allowance for doing that. Is that just a, a joke or is that really going on? Is there a sort of Wahhabi penetration into Bosnia and what's going on? How is it succeeding, if it is at all? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for, for this question. Uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, in your question uh, you, you have the answer. I think we Bosnians are, uh, how will you say, um, I believe we are very honest people. We are not Muslims because Arabs came to Bosnia. We were Muslims before, but we are Muslims not uh, like professionals. The, uh, Islam is not for us a profession. It is just a way of your uh, life. And you don't make, make uh, you know, you don't make something that the others, do, do, to disturb others. You are just as you are. We have uh, our neighbors who are of different, we are so mixed in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina that it is very difficult to imagine uh, uh, the, the uh, different way. I was raised as a child with my neighbor who was Orthodox uh, Christian, and we were, uh, as children, we were very much uh, eager to, for Eastern when they have eggs. And we were competing with each other who will, who will collect more eggs from our neighbors. And when we had the Kurban Bayram, you know, when you have this meat, 
and the Christian boys and, and they were competing who will get more meat, you know, from, from each other. This is how it Bosnia used to be and I think is still there. As to Wahhabis, I mean, first of all, this story about Wahhabis is very long, we don't have time. There is a political Wahhabism and theological Wahhabism, if you like. But there is no such group in the world that call itself Wahhabis. This is only our interpretation of what Wahhabi could be. But we can, we can say that there, was, there were some people who came to Bosnia and Herzegovina and did not understand the spirit of Bosnia, did not understand us. And because they did not understand us, they thought that we are not enough Muslims. So we did have some people who came to Bosnia and said, these people are not enough Muslims, so we want to make them more Muslim than they are. All right. And then there were some Europeans who come to us and tell us, these people are too much Muslims. We, we want them to, be, to make them more Europeans than they are. So we have difficulty in, uh, to please everyone, you know. We are not good enough Muslims for those people, and we are not, uh, not Muslims for these people who are telling us. But uh, I, we, we have funny stories. Uh, like um, question of beards and question of these formalities and so on. We, me as a mufti, I did not need to get any declaration or any uh, uh, dictate for, for that. People themselves were telling to these people, what, what is with you? Are you crazy? You know, we, this is our way. This is our Islam, and we will learn this from our fathers, and so on and so on. So, in Bosnia Herzegovina, we are not, uh, how you say, uh, we don't have Wahhabis, if, if, you, if you, whatever. But, whether some events in the Muslim world affect some individuals, and they are trying to somehow think differently. Yes, there are some people who are affected by this. But the mainstream of Bosnian Muslims, they are, how you say, not the best Muslim in the world, but they are not the worst Muslims in the world. So they are in the middle some way, and I am happy with them. So whatever will happen with them, I am with them. I, I hope that they, God is pleased with them. And then, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Assalamu. Please. I am a new Muslim. Um, I'm born, raised American, Irish, Polish descent. Um, Excellent. And, you know, a number of other things, but um, that's very besides the point. Um, I'm wondering if you can sort of, a lot of what appealed to me about Islam when I was learning about it was that it seems to be a kind of, at least here, and I'm sure it must be different where you're from because you're um, coming from a, a long-standing community of Muslims, whereas the Muslim community in America is relatively young um, and, and small. Uh, but it, it seems to be a very grassroots religion, sort of... Um, the way I learned about Islam and the things that impressed me most and the understandings that I've come to that are deepest and most profound for me have, have come from people I've met who are just very special people and don't necessarily have any official role in the community whatsoever. And I mean, some of them are American, some of them are not American. Um, and I guess I, as an American, you know, and I, I also desire to learn more about my religion, but I don't necessarily feel that there are institutions in my country that, you know, I, from which I can obtain I, I, that knowledge. I understand you, what you are saying. And I, I am, um, I think it's better that I don't say anything. <laughs> because what you, say is, what you say, it is enough, and please continue the way you are. 
And, you know, you, uh, your comment reminds me of the saying of uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, you know, uh, famous uh, Sufi, you may agree or disagree with him. He said, I went to church to, to find God and I didn't find him. I went to synagogue to find him and I didn't find him. I went to the mosque to see him and I didn't see him. I came to home and I find him in my heart. So this is what you are saying. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I kind of just, I wanted to ask you, yes. and I, I know that you, you said that you, you don't necessarily have a specific vision for the institutionalization of Islam, but um, in, the, in this context, um, and especially you know, in our context, which of course is different from yours, how does that work? You know, there, is, there are two, uh, three terms that, that are very important, religion, morality, and faith. I think there is a difference between, religion is more an organization, a community, and we need organization, we need community, sort of. We, we, we are born, we die, we need the social, you know, in, engagement, we know treatment each other. So this is the organization. You have to have place, the mass, you have to have somebody who is responsible, and no one, it's, it cannot be just anyone comes. And then you have morality that, it's a question of good and evil, what, what do you think? And then you have faith, which is very personal. You know, in the, each and every one of us has its own way of, of uh, having faith in your heart. So that's the, that's the private, this is yours, and no one can take it, and whether organization or not. So keep it as you are, and may God bless you. Inshallah, you as well. Okay. Okay, okay, let me see your two questions. Okay? Okay, please. Um, okay, the, uh, the last controversy, the most recent controversy that uh, we here in the United States are aware of between the Islamic world and Europe is the question of the Danish cartoons. Um, tonight you praised the idea of freedom of speech, and I assume that extends also to freedom of the press. Um, there's that on the one hand. There's also just the fact that every single page of every single newspaper is illustrated with, with pictures. Every single page of every single magazine that is ever printed nowadays is illustrated with pictures. And there are images and things that people can pull up off the Internet, say, with just a, a single click of the finger. In such a world, and with yourself uh, praising the value of the freedom of speech, how would you reconcile the uh, issues like the issues brought up by the Danish cartoons? Well, I, I think the uh, Danish cartoon did not decrease the respect of the Prophet Muhammad in the hearts of Muslims. I think Muslims even more appreciate now the Prophet, and he was mentioned on the old televisions more than ever before. And I, at the same time, I don't think that this cartoon has increased this expression of freedom in Europe. I don't think so. I mean, this is not... But what it did, I think, it left a bitter feeling. And because this cartoon meant to hurt, it's not, you know, just cartoon, you know. You may have a cartoon, of course, uh, you know that Dante Alighieri, what he wrote in his uh, Divine Comedy is worse than the cartoon of... Uh, but you know, this is the book, and you can read or not read, uh, but image of... Uh, but I think the circumstances in which this came with uh, this uh, debate between the East and the West and the Muslim world and, and, and the West, and uh, uh, I think it has to do with this anger that you heard from the Muslim world, you know? And, and uh, so I, I think this is un unfortunate. It is very interesting that today I was reading in Herald Tribune that uh, Danish tele state television has hired a first Muslim girl with hijab on a state television. Probably, it would, if it were not for this cartoon, she would never be on the state television in Denmark. So you can see uh, things are moving not uh, the way we want, but the things uh, 
are going uh, the way. I, um, I think uh, there is nothing absolute on this. Uh, either uh, the expression, you know that this uh, uh, professor of history in London, what is his name, who got three years uh, uh, in prison because he denied Holocaust. So this is also expression of freedom, right? Uh, of, uh, expression of uh, freedom of expression. But you cannot express this, deny genocide, uh, Holocaust. And I agree with the judge. You cannot just uh, say because denial of genocide is crime or denial of crime is a crime. And this is for the first time that the judges, I think, international lawyers are thinking that the denial of crime is a crime itself. Okay. I, I very, uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I just have a question about uh, your sort of vision of, and I have to preface this, this is kind of a developing question, so bear with me, everyone. Um, with your visions of, of um, Muslims in the Western world of, of really younger generation of people who are not born yet, who will be born into this, or whose parents are, are, you know, have been born in these Western countries like the United States or France or um, England. And if, if these communities don't want to be isolated, which I, I personally believe is, is a bad idea, so you, you need some integration. And what that's going to, and it's a, that's a two-way street, right, where you're going to um, have integration of the, of the Muslim minority into the majority and, and you know, acceptance of the majority of the, this minority and their beliefs and whatnot. Um, but I can sort of imagine in my head that, y you know, you'll have um, these, this next generation of, of Muslim um, boys and girls or men and women. Um, and what, what happens when someone, you know, a woman is not availed or wears a short skirt, you know, in the summer or a guy who totally gets drunk in college or whatever. And you know, because right now the, um, I think the vision of Islam is that you are not really Muslim unless you, you know, are a practicing complete follower of, of Islam. And I just have, uh, you know, I have a lot of Jewish friends who were not practicing Jews and went to these um, Jewish youth groups and went to Israel. And I think that really um, helped them sort of um, keep the connection with the, their religion and faith and sort of their, their um, culture that derives from that religion. Do you think that this is something that's going to be happening with young Muslims? Is that okay? Or, or what, what is it sort of, what do you think, you can comment sort of on, on the future generations of, of young Muslims? Thanks. I, I hope that the future will be better than uh, our past and that uh, you may influence that your future be better. Uh, now, uh, I think this is not for the first time, and it is not only that Muslims are discussing within themselves who is right, who is wrong, who belongs to the community, who doesn't belong. This is an old question. But what, what I would appeal and I uh, hope that we will develop uh, internal into uh, tolerance uh, among ourselves. I, I, we should uh, recognize that we are not monolithic, unified, uh, universal community, and you understand that very well in the United States because you meet here different people from different countries and then you see the different experiences. I believe in diversity of the Islamic expression. I believe, I believe in the diversity of Islamic interpretation. And we have four mezhabs, you know, that uh, within Islam that are all recognized as valid mezhabs. This should be a basis for democracy, if you like, that we can have different opinions. And what, what, what is dangerous, though, that some people are claiming that they possess the whole truth and then they proclaim those who go, will go to hell and those who will go to heaven. I am very glad that uh, God did not leave us this, this uh, issue, who is going to hell, who is going to heaven. And we know in the Quran many times that this is not our right and we should not do this. 
But some people are very much, you know, they, they see Islam and they see their role as to be immediate or to be imminent. And they want to see the hell here and the paradise here. And they want to play the role of God. This is not possible. This was not possible before. It is not possible now. It will not be possible in the future. But as to you, young generation Muslims, I have great hope in you. Please, you, you especially here in, in the United States, you have a good environment to get good knowledge, get straight A's and B's. You can get some B's. <laughs> Uh, finish your school, get good job, get, uh, you know, uh, get good girl or boy and get married, have a children, not, not too many, but if you can afford, you can have many, and live healthy life. Don't go to uh, uh, medical examination uh, before you see what you eat, don't smoke, don't drink, and, and other, all other things. And then, of course, you will be a good Muslim. I think uh, uh, the world needs uh, healthy people. And if you are a good Muslim, you are supposed to be healthy, good, uh, tolerant, nice, smiling, hmm? <laughs> and uh, reaching people out, and, uh, and not to be mean. You should be serious, but not to mean, because, my, you know, and not condemn people. My, my practice is, uh, my experience is that whenever I said people you are bad, he was not better later on. But even if he is a bad, and I tell him you are good, he is trying to be better than he used to be. We learn two things in Bosnia, and this is, I want you to just to finish this. The first, the law is not in the book. The law is in the heart. So you have to change your heart in order to know. We had the best constitution in Yugoslavia in the communist time. But if there's something wrong is in the heart, it is useless in the book. And the second thing is, tolerance is the sign of strength. Intolerance is the sign of weakness. If you are strong, if you know who you are, your identity, you are tolerant to others. But if you are weak, then you become intolerant because you cannot tolerate others who are different from you. Thank you for your patience.